Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast, part of the Aston Originals series, providing fresh perspectives from Aston University experts. My name is Robbie Love and I'm a lecturer in English language here at Aston University. I'm a corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends and variations using large samples of language data. So on behalf of the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group, welcome to the show. Corpus Cast is the show all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. In this series, I speak with top researchers in the field to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied to a diverse range of areas. In this episode of Corpus Cast, our topic is how corpus linguistics contributes to research in the area of investigating and centering marginalized voices. My guest today is Dr. Mark Narty, lecturer in English Language and Linguistics at the University of the West of England and member of the Bristol Centre for Linguistics. Mark works across several disciplines, including corpus linguistics, of course, to investigate how people deploy language in specific spatio-temporal and socio-cultural contexts to achieve various aims, including identity construction and negotiation, self-promotion and othering, as well as argumentation, resistance, and delegitimation. Mark is a truly international scholar, having studied and worked in Ghana, Norway, and Hong Kong before now finding himself working here in the UK. So I'm very pleased to welcome to this episode of Corpus Cast our special guest, Dr. Mark Narty. Hello, Mark. Great to see you. Hello, Robbie. Great to see you too. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much for coming on to uh, Corpus Cast. It's such a pleasure to get the chance to, to speak with you. And it's the first time we've, we've really had the chance to, to talk about uh, your work and, uh, and Corpus Linguistics. So um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I wanted to start by asking you quite a big question, really. Um, and I know that Corpus Linguistics is, is not you know, uh, fully sort of everything you do with your research, but it certainly informs a lot of your work. Um, what does corpus linguistics uh, mean to you? Well, generally, I conceptualize corpus linguistics as a rigorous methodology and a powerful tool for studying authentic language use. So to me, it is a robust analytic framework that helps us to arrive at more accurate, more verifiable and more reliable findings. And more importantly for me, I uh, perceive corpus linguistics as very malleable and robust in the sense that its uh, extent of application or applicability cuts across different spheres of applied uh, linguistic research. So generally, when I conceptualize corpus linguistics, I think of a powerful tool, I think of a robust framework, and I think of a rigorous methodology that aids or helps us to engage with authentic language use. Wow, that was uh, <laughs> a great way of putting it. Um, I, I totally agree. Um, I, I want to know a bit more about how, you know, and this is a question I ask all of all of our guests here. Um, and I'm always really curious about the answer because there's, there's something different for everyone. How did you first hear about corpus linguistics and how did you get working in corpus linguistics your, yourself in your research? I think I got into corpus linguistics sometime in 2015 when I was coming to the end of my M4 research at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. So towards the end of that program, I started brainstorming PhD topics because I'd always uh, had in mind PhD research and working in academia, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I started uh, brainstorming topics. And as part of my conceptualization process, I spoke with one of my undergraduate lecturers. He's called Richmond Sadiq Ngula. Well, Richmond UCC, University of Cape Coast in Ghana, was a PhD candidate at Lancaster University. Indeed, he was supervised by Tony McHenry. So he mentioned the idea of corpus linguistics and more specifically, corpus assisted discourse studies to me. So based on the preliminary information he gave me, I did my own reading. And the first paper I read was uh, by Baker et al on the useful synergy between corpus linguistics and critical discourse analysis. So that paper, together with other papers in corpus assisted discourse studies, then shaped my orientation. And uh, I used that information to formulate my PhD proposal and subsequently conducted my uh, PhD in uh, corpus assisted discourse study. So essentially, I'm going to attribute it to my 2015 encounter with Richmond Sadek Ngula, who was a PhD candidate as at Lancaster. 
That's that's so great to hear. I I remember Richmond well. Um, you oh, that's that great. He, that's 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 great. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that he was he was supervised by Tony McHenry as as was I, and so um, I I remember him from 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 that time. And uh, uh, it's so great to hear that he um, continued to to inspire others. And you mentioned, of yeah. course, Paul Baker as well. Paul Baker was our first guest uh, on Corpus Cast. Yeah, I and, saw that. I saw that episode. Oh, great! It was it was great to chat with him, and and it's it's no surprise that he's you know uh, inspired so many so many other researchers. So that's uh, that's that's really nice to hear. Um, as I mentioned, you you some of your work uses corpus methods, um, but but I suppose more broadly, you would you consider yourself a, a critical discourse analyst, sort yeah, of first sure. and foremost. Yeah. Um, and you use a range of methods, including corpus methods. Um, a lot of work in critical discourse analysis, uh, CDA, um, looks at how powerful uh, entities like the media talk about minoritized groups. Um, and certainly that's, you know, a lot of the, the research that, that researchers like Paul Baker and others do would, I think, uh, fairly uh, fall into that category. Um, and you do some of that sort of work, but a lot of your work focuses on discourses produced by these non-dominant groups themselves. For example, uh, you recently published some work on African anthems uh, of former British colonies. How important is it to take this approach of, of listening to the voices of, of those um, people who don't necessarily uh, always have the platform to share their views? I think taking this approach is extremely important because it helps us to highlight emancipatory discourses and more importantly, to center the voice and the agency of non-dominant groups. So as you rightly indicated, the majority of studies on non-dominant groups take this top-down approach, okay? So the focus is on how elite groups or more powerful organizations like the media and politicians, et cetera, et cetera, construct or represent these you know, groups of people. Now, while I do not discount such research, because I think it is very important, there is a need for us to continue working in that area because it helps us to uh, expose injustices and uh, reveal inequities, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't discount that at all. We don't have to cool it down. I think we should continue in that area. But I also think it's necessary as part of emancipatory efforts and as part of uh, shaping the perception of people regarding non-dominant groups to also foreground the perspectives and the voices of these people, more importantly, from their own perspective. Mm. And so that is why, you know, I take uh, this approach. And I think if we combine that perspective with the existing perspective of the top-down approach, that would be uh, a more holistic way of engaging discourses on non-dominant groups. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, you've you've been working in this area for 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 some time now. And and I and I must say, you know, when when you look at your your academic CV, um, it's it's absolutely astonishing. Um, Thank the, you very much. The quantity, but the quality of 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 your work. I hope you don't mind me saying that. Um, I, I I'm just in in admiration of 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 your work. Um, I'm humbled. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, oh well, uh, thanks. <laughs> um, what does uh, research and, and your own and, and and others as well? And I appreciate this is a really broad question, so feel free to you know focus in on on any specific context. But what does the research that you and others have done say about how non-dominant groups use language to um, perhaps construct their own identity uh, and and represent themselves in the context that we're talking about here of not looking at how do others represent these groups, but how do, yeah. how do they represent themselves in right. the language? Yeah. So here I want to share with you uh, a recent special uh, volume or special uh, issue that I edited for critical discourse studies on emancipatory discourses. So if you don't mind, I'll highlight three of the ways by which this non-dominant groups use language to construct their own uh, identity based on the special issue that I did for uh, critical discourse studies. So in this study, um, I had a number of people researching feminist groups, uh, other ethnic minorities, uh, Blacks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in regions such as Latin America, uh, the Arab Levant, and Africa. And the summary of you know that study was that one non-dominant groups 
construct a positive identity for themselves by actively resisting discriminatory and hegemonic discourses directed against them. And here I want to make a distinction between actively resisting discriminatory discourses and exposing discriminatory discourses. So whereas the existing studies, you know, from the top down, you know, approach reveals most of these uh, discriminatory discourses, there isn't always the case of active resistance. It's as though those studies assume or uh, make this presupposition that once you've revealed, that is also a direct way of resistance. All right, but in these discourses of the non-dominant view themselves, there is an intentional, there is a more explicit resistance. All right, mm. and so that is the uh, first way by which they construct positive identities. The second thing is that they use their language to foreground their voice and agency by speaking truth to power, and by so doing, moving away from discourses of powerlessness that have been often associated with them. So more often than not, the discourse surrounding these groups of people border on repression and powerlessness mm -hmm. and their weaknesses, you know, et cetera, et cetera, which, you know, as I said, it, it's fine. But when they speak about themselves, they also emphasize their agency, they emphasize uh, their voice, they emphasize their power. And I think that helps them to reconstruct their experiences in more positive ways. And then the third thing that uh, came out from that special issue is that they use their language as part of identity construction to engage in solidarity formation for group empowerment. So mm -hmm. the idea of um, group loyalty, you know, group cohesion, solidarity, alliance, et cetera, et cetera, mobilization, they use their language to, to do that kind of thing. And then based mm -hmm. on that, uh, they, they, move, they move into more practical, you know, actions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to summarize, I'll say, if you look at the use of language by these groups of people, it realizes an inspiring function. So I construe their use of language as discord that realizes uh, not just an emancipatory function, but also as an inspiring artifact. Wow. Yeah, that sounds that sounds fascinating. And, and I think really, as you said before, you know, can complement compliment, uh, from from a different angle a lot of a lot of the work that is done about how how you know dominant uh, groups speak about speak about these groups of people, their their own you know constructions of of self. I think is yeah. fascinating, um, and and I think this ties in nicely to to one of the ways that you describe your own research, which is in seeking uh, for the the centering of of marginalized voices, and and I really like what you just said there about this is almost kind of it's research to to learn more, of course, but it's also research to to uh, give attention and almost to campaign on behalf or for yeah. uh, groups that don't necessarily get the representation um, or the rights that they deserve. So, so turning to the contribution of corpus linguistics, as mentioned, you 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 are a corpus linguist. Um, what do you see as being the potential? of corpus linguistics to contribute to this area? The potential is great indeed. And one area I want to highlight is scaling up and the broadening of the scope of research. So as far as my reading is concerned, the few studies that highlight emancipatory discourses are largely qualitative and uh, small scale in terms of scope. Now, in light of big data research, especially when engaging policymakers and non-academic partners, I think corpus linguistic research can make a significant contribution to discourses that center and uh, foreground the voices of non-dominant groups in the area of scaling up uh, this, 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 these studies. Now, the reason why I think that is important uh, is because the practical recommendations and the interventions that these researchers make, I feel, can be strengthened and be enhanced and be solidified from the point of view of corpus linguistic research. Mm. Because, you know, practically speaking, anytime you engage uh, non-academic partners or, you know, collaborators, et cetera, et cetera, they, they, they are big on generalization and they are interested in the extent of, mm. you know, what one is talking about. So even though we know it does not always apply for practical reasons, sometimes there is a need 
to be able to generalize the things that you are saying. And there's a need to uh, establish that the scope of what you are saying is, is bigger, you know, than, than what it seems. And so in that, to that extent, I think corpus linguistic research has the potential to significantly contribute to work on emancipatory discourses. More so when at the current time, it seems corpus linguistic research hasn't quite focused on that. That's interesting. So, uh, I mean, is there any work in this area already from, from a corpus perspective, or is this really, you know, a, a new frontier potentially? So from my reading, the corpus linguistic work on this area focuses more on protest discourses on social mm -hmm. media as an instance of emancipatory discourses. Mm -hmm. But I consider protest discourses as slightly different from the kind of emancipatory discourses that I'm talking about. So you're likely to find a lot of studies on maybe the Hong Kong protests or, you know, protests in the Middle East, you know, et cetera, et cetera, which lend credence to emancipatory discourses. But I feel that is a bit different mm -hmm. from um, ethnic minorities and, you know, LGBTQ people and, you know, um, you know, racial minorities, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So from the point of view of corpus linguistics, yeah, the work that I have seen is in the area of protest discourse. But as far as uh, other non-dominant groups are concerned, currently, I do not think there is a strong commitment from corpus linguists in that area. That That's that's a really, um, I think it's important that, that you you say this and and i think you know that that was that that's a, a question really is whether whether you think there is enough of a commitment in corpus linguistics um towards what you might call the the scholarship of non-dominant discourses and, and your argument is that is that there there hasn't been so far um yeah. what do you think what do you think needs to change do you think this is a a, a sort of an attitudinal issue or or a practical issue or or yeah. or the fact mm. that you know by by virtue or by their nature dominant groups are more potentially more visible there is more data and yeah. so it's it's easy you know a lot of researchers who study newspaper discourse for example yeah i would argue one of the main reasons and they maybe don't acknowledge this all the time um one of the main reasons they do so is because it's one of the easiest kinds of data to gather and there's lots of it and Agreed. so it's attractive to corpus yeah. linguists. Yeah. But I think in in discourse studies, perhaps we're a little bit over fixated with newspaper language. I I, I get why, you know, I'm, I, it's not a criticism of, you know, I, I do, you know, I teach newspaper discourse at Aston. Uh, I've, you know, I lots of people do, and, and I, I understand its value. But I think sometimes um, CADs in general, uh, corpus assisted discourse studies is almost kind of, the subfield of corpus linguistics that looks at newspaper discourse mostly yeah. and, uh, and bits of other things too. Maybe that's a bit of a strong claim, but I I, I want to know your thoughts on this because I think yeah, it's, it's really I, I, interesting. I, I, I agree with, you know, the point you just, you know, adduce, which is more of the practical reason, but I think there are two main reasons. The practical, you know, I'll consider that to be the second reason, but the first reason that comes to my mind is uh, the tradition of corpus assisted discourse studies in itself. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the history of you know corpus assisted discourse studies, it started with research on um, non-dominant groups from the point of view of dominant groups or from the point yeah. of view you know of of the elite, which also goes back to the orientation behind CDA research in general. All right, because the orientation of CDA research is to look at the discourses of the elite. You know, mm -hmm. in relation to yeah. uh, the communists, all right. So that orientation is already there. There is like a school of thought already. So it seems to be the natural thing to do to examine the media, to examine politicians, mm -hmm. to examine uh, you know more elitist you know discourses. So I feel consciously or unconsciously, maybe more unconsciously, people naturally uh, work with that kind of orientation. So that that is the first you know reason that I, I yeah. think I can adduce for for the uh -huh. current situation. Uh -huh. And the second is what you talked about in terms of uh, from a more practical or a more pragmatic you know, perspective, these non-dominant groups, because they don't really have the voice in society, they don't talk a lot. So you don't find a lot of their discourses. It is not easy for you to just build a 10 million word corpus yeah. on, on, on you know, the discourse of LGBTQ people. I, may, I think it's very difficult to do that. 
All right. So in terms of um, for sometimes for good reason, these people choose to be silent. All right. So they don't talk a lot. Maybe you don't find them too much on social media. Of course, all this is changing with the progress that we are all making in the world. But generally, you don't find the voices of those people, you know, out there. So it takes a lot more work to be able to uh, get data from this group of people from their own perspective. Mm. So as you said, the media looks like an easier, not easy, but an easier way of getting data. So most people maybe, you know, go with that kind of tangent. So I, I consider this as two main reasons why there isn't currently a strong commitment from corpus uh, yeah. linguists as far as uh, research on non-dominant groups are concerned. That's really interesting. And and I appreciate I'm sort of going off script a bit here. It's just what you said is, is fascinating. So I, I want to stick with this for a moment before we move on. Um, what, you know, a, a question that, that always goes through my mind when, and you see people talk about this on social media, researchers talk about this, that this idea of, well, you know, someone wading in to a context and sort of saying, I'm, I'm a researcher and I've decided that I'm interested in your life and I'm going to gather all your data and analyze it and tell you um, everything that's, that's, you know, I'm going to elucidate you with my, my grand knowledge. Um, of course, you know, I, I, and I think there is, a, there is a history, particularly in, um, you know, typological studies yeah. from decades ago of, of researchers from uh, wealthy uh, Western universities flying off to some faraway land and recording um, people uh, who are in a very, very different uh, context um, and writing a book about them and, and then disappearing off and, and you oh. know, having a career. So how, I, I suppose from, from your perspective, and how do you remain sensitive to the challenges of, well, are there certain groups of people, do they want to be researched, you know, yeah. about? <laughs> um, and, and, and I suppose this gets onto the issue of, of sort of the co-production of research. For example, you've, you've done a lot of work in uh, Ghanaian contexts. Yeah. Um, and how, how does that sort of relationship um, sort of play out in your own, in your own experience? Right. So, I think, you know, the point you made about, you know, co, you know, creation and collaborating with the people that you are conducting the research, you know, about is an extremely, you know, important thing. And that is one way by which, you know, I approach this issue. Mm -hmm. So there is, I've, I've, forgotten, I've forgotten the scholar's name, but he says something to the effect that such research must not just be conducted on these people or about these people, mm -hmm. but more importantly, with them. And I feel sometimes uh, as, a, as, as academics, there's a tendency to conduct a study on our participants or about our participants rather than uh, with them. And I think so, especially yeah. as, as, a, as corpus, uh, in terms of corpus research, we're particularly guilty of that because of course, the scale of the data we're gathering, we wanna gather lots of data from typically lots of people, which necessarily makes yeah. it less personal. Right, because exactly. you don't just have one or five or ten participants; you may have hundreds or thousands. Right. Yeah, and of course, that is also, you know, the, the idea of engaging the people. Also, sometimes has its own practical, you know, constraints. You know, you, you need a time to do that, and the availability, and you know, whether they want to do it, you know, at all, and I can. So, so that, that requires, you know, more more efforts. But I think that effort is worth it if we want to stay true to uh, the ethics of the field and to make the impact that we want to make, which I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, later. And I think it's mm -hmm. absolutely important that we do the study, not just on and about them, but more importantly, with them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, impact because, you know, in, in, uh, in linguistics and, and other fields of social science, you know, there is for the several years been an increasing kind of focus on the visibility of, of, of the impact of our work um, and of course, applied linguistics uh, is also very much at the forefront of that. Uh, corpus linguistics as well. Um, when you're, you know, as you said, a lot of your work sort of uh, contributes to what you might call an emancipatory agenda. Yeah. And so clearly, part of that is trying to shape uh, opinion and start conversations and debates based on the work you're doing. How do you go about? doing that and, and what sorts of responses have you had to uh to your research so at the uh, present time 
I'll say the main uh, level of, if I can call it impact that I've mm-hmm. been able to generate is in terms of the dissemination of my mm-hmm. research. So mm-hmm. beyond, you know, publishing, you know, in papers and, uh, you know, uh, advertising my work on social media, et cetera, et cetera. I try as much as possible to sometimes do opinion pieces or to uh, put my you know, research in other forms that is accessible to non-academic audiences. Mm. So that is the, the main uh, if like way by which I've tried to carry my research you know, to, 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 to the people you know, out there. And so I, I consider this also as one of my challenges, okay, mm-hmm. because, and here I want to make, make reference to my positionality as an early career researcher. I, I do not have a strong network outside academia yet. Okay, so mm-hmm. emphasis on yet, I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. Yeah. So that, is definitely, that <laughs> yeah. is definitely a challenge for me because the kind of work that I do requires non-academic partnership. Mm-hmm. And, you know, getting non-academic partnership comes with a certain level of, uh popularity and a certain level of you know credibility and recognition you know in society etc etc which you know i don't have yet and so that is maybe you know the main challenge you know for me at the moment but and so despite this challenge i still try my best possible to disseminate my my, my findings to non-academic you know audiences and that's what i've been doing in the meantime you know now you've been on corpus cast i mean that's that's all about to change you know you're right i love it awesome awesome thanks man. i'm joking i'm joking but it, it, that's a good point you know El- elena Semino said that as well you know in her episode um she was talking about exactly the same sorts of challenges uh right. of, of working with with um academic partners and and that this is she talked about how this was the the, the basis of um, non-academic partners i should say she talked about how this you know, is a cumulative process that has taken much of her career thus far to develop mm. these these networks and and these uh, reliable partners. Um, and so, I I totally appreciate what you're saying. And and as as a fellow early career researcher, I I also feel uh, the same way. Um, that's that's really interesting, though. Um, what has been? Another, mm-hmm. I was going to say another challenge that you know I personally you know perceive outside of the. Uh, non-academic you know partnership mm-hmm. is this idea that sometimes for very practical reasons it is difficult to adopt what I call an activist scholar posture mm-hmm. all right and that is important because when you're working with non-dominant groups the idea is not just to do the research the idea is to effect change and mm-hmm. sometimes to effect the change you need to be an activist or some, some form of advocacy. You need to in, embed advocacy, you know, in your work. But there are times when, you know, for me as a researcher, for one reason or the other, I find it maybe not uh, feasible in certain situations to be able to do that kind of advocacy work. And so sometimes, you know, I choose to be silent for, for good reason. And so that's also a very, a very practical, you know, challenge as well, mm-hmm. where you can have the findings, but for one reason or the other, based on your reading of the situation and for depending on where you are, maybe in the in, in the world, it becomes more challenging for you to advocate for certain things or to be at the forefront of, of, of certain things. So that, that's also another challenge for me as an individual. That's really interesting. How, how do you manage that? I, I almost see kind of two competing pressures here, mm. researcher as activist and researcher as scientist. Um, and that what is- I mean by that is, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, Tony McHenry earlier, um, He's he's recently been uh, talking about ideas of uh, the the scientific basis of of corpus linguistics and rationality right. and 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 issues around that. And on the one hand, you know, in terms of corpus linguistics, at least, uh, I think corpus linguists often feel a pressure to sort of say, "Oh, well, this is this is real science. You know, this is really objective, and we have all these." You mentioned before, you know, rigorous and and replicable yeah. me- methods and and things like that, and and that all kind of implies or even explicitly claims a sort of uh, bird's eye perspective. We're, we're we're not we're not involved. We're sort of looking from a distance and we're observing and we're describing. We're sim- we're neutral, mm. right? We're just describing yeah. language. But you're also talking here about taking taking a stance, right? Yeah, taking an ideological exactly. and political position. Which of course is is really very much in the tradition of critical discourse analysis, yeah. analysts, as, as you said. But how do those two 
sort of live with each other comfortably? Do they live with each other comfortably, or, yeah. or do you see, do you see them as competing, or or do you think that they they work together well? I actually think they work together well. So I see the two not as an either or. I see mm -hmm. it as a both end. And mm -hmm. here I want to reference uh, John Richardson, who says that when we are dealing with social issues, we can't be neutral. What mm -hmm. we can be is to be rigorous in our methodological procedures. We can be as robust and as detailed as we can in our methods or procedures, but we can be neutral mm -hmm. in an attempt to be objective. And <laughs> I agree with him that when you're dealing with social issues, it is important sometimes to take a stance and to be able to embed advocacy, uh, you know, within the research. So I don't think it is an either or at all. I think, mm -hmm. yes, you can be scientific and you can also uh, be subjective or take a stance and explain this positionality. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's an issue of positionality and you should be able to engage with your positionality and uh, explain why you have that positionality. Mm. Absolutely. That that's. I think there's a lot of food for thought here. Um, this is honestly, it, it's 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 so interesting to to get the chance to talk with you about this. So thanks so much. Um, we'll start to um, wrap things up, and and I I, I have a series of so-called quick questions that I like to um, ask my guests, and sometimes the answers are quick, and sometimes they're not. That's fine. We've got we've got plenty of time. Um, what are the biggest changes that you've noticed in corpus research uh, in your career so far? So from 2015 up until now, you know, which is a very short engagement, you know, with uh, corpus linguistics, it has been a number of, you know, changes. Mm -hmm. the, the field has evolved. The uh, field has witnessed, as far as I'm concerned, tremendous, you know, progress. And here I want to highlight uh, three main changes. The first is in the scope of work and the regional and geographical distribution of the studies. So currently, corpus linguistic methods are being applied in nearly all fields of linguistics. And for me, that is, you know, that is amazing. It, it gives us a clear indication of how the field has evolved and the level of acceptability of the of the of the framework is is incredible, and mm -hmm. in terms of geographical uh, distribution, I did a meta analysis of corpus assisted discourse studies in 2019, where you know it was evident that areas like Africa and um, South America and the Arab Levant and even Oceania weren't that big, you know, on corpus linguistics, but in recent years the the work in these areas has tremendously, you know, increased, right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of scope, both in terms of applicability of the framework to other applied linguistic research and the geographical and regional or aerial distribution of the studies, I think uh, the field has come a long way. And that is the uh, first chain that I see. The second is in the development of new tools and software, as well as the upgrade of existing ones. Mm -hmm. You know, that is, I think that is, like a mainstay really. So, and I know you have done certain things in that area as well, especially in terms of building, you know, new corpora, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. So I, I think the field has not been static at all. It's been very mm -hmm. dynamic and it's been uh, onward, forward and upward. And the final change I want to talk about relates to the podcast you are doing now. And that borders on impact. I think in recent years, there's been an intentional and a systematic attempt to foreground impact in corpus linguistic research. Mm -hmm. And this podcast, you know, without a doubt, is, is, is one of them. And I want to commend you and your team for this innovative, you know, idea. So in the last few years, there's been a lot of emphasis on impact. And, you know, I've seen a lot of YouTube videos and workshops mm -hmm. on corpus linguistics and impact. And I've been in conferences where you know, it has been the, the main focus. I've been in panels and workshops and things like mm -hmm. that. So I think there is an intentional effort, you know, at making an impact, which I think is a very good thing because we don't just want to do the research. More mm. important, we want to carry that research into society and hopefully make the world a better place. So these are the three main uh, changes that I'll say I've uh, observed in the last uh, few years that have been part of corpus linguistics. 
Well, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, what you what you said there about um, about this about this show. I, I see this as as one sort of small way of of contributing to what what I agree is is an increasing um, visibility of corpus linguistics in in general. Um, and and I you know I, I I agree that that you know we we've been working for a similar sort of period of time and and. Yes, it's only a few years, but even in that short space of time, I agree right. that, that there has been a, a big change even in that short space of time. Um, and that's really interesting and compared to what those who've been doing this for decades, you know, say about the changes that they've noticed, which is a lot more to do with the scale, as you can imagine, um, right. of the, the size of the data sets and the power and sophistication right. of the tools. But even in the last few years, you know, there, there, there are these really interesting and important changes. Um, my second question is, is a new one. I haven't asked this to anyone before, so you get the first go at answering this one. Um, what is the biggest misconception of corpus linguistics that you have encountered? One of the big ones for me is this idea that corpus linguistics is all about using computers or <laughs> pressing certain, you know, buttons on the computer. Mm -hmm. in order to get results. Now, this misconception is linked to the idea that corpus linguistics is easy or mm -hmm. it is easier in comparison with other analytic uh, approaches in linguistics. So people have the misconception mm -hmm. that, for instance, it is possible to become a corpus linguistic expert in one workshop or in one mm -hmm. summer school. And so sometimes when you engage uh, non-academic partners and you know, you make them aware of how powerful this tool is and how useful it can be. They have the tendency to think that you can just run maybe a one week workshop or a three day workshop for their staff and boom, they can become, you know, experts in corpus linguistics and they can also use the tools and all of that, which I feel, you know, is, uh, is, is, is a misconception. So definitely from one of the biggest is this idea that, oh, it's all about computers and it's mm -hmm. fancy and, oh, it's about, you know, some tools that you can apply and you can get this fascinating results and you can just run away with them and do, you know, the infographics and all of those shiny stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad that you say that because I, I, I get this a lot as well. I totally agree. People think you just press a few buttons and look at some numbers and go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. This has gone up and this has gone down. But ultimately, it is still linguistics. And so, you, absolutely. first and foremost, you know, it's very easy for people to say, oh, I'm a corpus linguist as if it's completely different. But you know, first and foremost, we're linguists. We, we study yeah. language, and it's yeah. one of many methods that that people may choose to use. So, I, that's reassuring to hear you say that as well. Um, my final question to you is um, a bit more. Well, I, I hope optimistic. We'll see what you see what you think. Um, how will or perhaps should could corpus linguistics make an impact on the world in the future? You know, here, I want to start by, you know, referencing uh, Paul Baker in one of his talks on impact. He goes like, impact is a long-term game. Yep. And I think it's very important for all of us to, to appreciate that assertion. Absolutely. Impact is a long-term game. And so this is the way, you know, I'll respond to your question. I'll say that all the things that we are doing now, whether in forensic linguistics, uh, non-dominant groups, health communication, uh, all the other areas of uh, corpus linguistics, you know, application, I think in 20, in 50, in 100 years time, those things are going to have even greater and even stronger impact. Mm -hmm. So I see our impact as cumulative. Yes, even though there is even impact now, I think what we're doing now is even going to have much greater impact, you know, in several years, in several years to come. So beyond the things that would ha happen in big data research and, you know, artificial intelligence and all those, you know, other incredible, you know, fields, you know, mm. which I still think C uh, corpus linguists can contribute to, I feel that the little things that we are even doing now would have a ripple effect and would get a momentum and have much greater impact in years to come. You know what? That is really, really uh, optimistic. More, even more optimistic than I thought, which is great. Yeah, I, I hope to join you on this journey. You know, maybe in thirty years' time, um, yeah. when maybe we're starting to slow down a little bit, 
we <laughs> we come yeah. back, we can come back and do this again and see what what happened you know sure. um we're in it for the long term so yeah Definitely. that's great that's great well um mark again thank you so much for 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 coming on um i've really really enjoyed this conversation um i really appreciate your time uh i will start to bring things to uh to a close here um and address the the camera our viewers if you're watching us on youtube of course um and if you're not watching but listening whether that's on spotify google podcast podcast addict or podchaser thank you very much for joining us on corpus cast please do let us know your thoughts about this and other episodes in the series using the hashtag corpus cast and make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus. Corpus Cast uh, is an Aston Originals podcast written and hosted by yours truly, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. Uh, thank you, Mark Nati, once again for joining us. Thank you for watching uh, or listening. And I hope to see you again on a future episode of Corpus Cast. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Robbie, for the uh, invite. I'm truly grateful.